Hi there, and welcome to this Mad Sense video in which I want to answer some of the what the bleep questions um, about first episodes and show you how we can actually simulate what's happening um, as, a, as a process. Um, the topics I want to cover in this video are um, the story, so the kind of the information component of uh, what uh, voices presented to me and how that led me to a particular um, conclusion. Uh, and then I want to show you the kind of process uh, behind that and how that actually uh, you know, changed the problems I was trying to solve and escalated my emotions uh, to the point of um, a panic attack and me uh, moving out of my apartment within the first um, seven or eight weeks. And then I'll show you how we can actually represent that as a simple process model. Uh, and then I'll pick out one or two um, uh, points as a sort of takeaway from this um, particular video. So the story, of course, was, and this is not an unusual one for people when they first um, start hearing voices, was that it's the neighbors. And uh, you know, not that shouldn't be too surprising. I had um, no uh, framework of reference called hearing voices or auditory hallucinations. Um, you know, uh, I might have read the occasional article, um, you know, about somebody who, who you're in the newspaper about somebody who heard voices. Um, but of course, I had no idea what that actually meant. So what I heard was the sound of two people um, talking about what I was doing. And I was living in this apartment in here in um, Hell's Kitchen in uh, New York. And uh, what's characteristic of some of these buildings and the, in Hell's Kitchen, and obviously this one, is this external fire escape. And the way this works is a couple of apartments, you, you access it from your window, and a couple of apartments uh, you know, share the same um, fire escape. Um, uh, so I was uh, at home alone, I was living alone. I was in the kitchen, I was making something to eat. And I heard this voice that I interpreted as female saying he seems to be okay. Uh, it was a little distant, uh, you know, so not like somebody sitting right next to me, but you know, just a little sort of quietish voice for another description. Actually, almost as if the people were, were speaking quietly, you know, as if they didn't, you know, almost as if they didn't uh, want to be heard or expect to be heard, perhaps. Um, and it was this sort of voice that I interpreted male in the background that just sort of grunted sort of, uh, non-committedly or certainly, you know, sort of less interested than the, than the first voice. Um, there were one or two um, other comments. Uh, and the one that, you know, that sticks in my memory is this one, um, he eats better than we do. Um, so of course, you know, the, the what the bleep um, questions, you know, that, that this provokes in the mind are, well, who is it? And, you know, and why am I, why am I hearing them? So the who is, a, you know, is an answer that you reach very, very quickly. Um, you know, the, the people, were, they could see what I was doing because they were talking about what I was doing. Uh, and of course, the only place from which you, you could see into my apartment was from the fire escape. So they had to be on the fire escape. Uh, the only people with access to the fire escape other than myself were the upstairs neighbors. So within two or three minutes, you reach the conclusion very logically, that uh, the only people that it could reasonably be are the upstairs neighbors. Uh, and of course, then the second question, uh, this was answered by this comment, he seems to be okay. Uh, so I had hurt myself that afternoon in the bathroom uh, quite badly and made a lot of noise, far more noise than I would ordinarily um, make. Uh, and certainly enough for me to ask the question, well, had they perhaps heard the commotion that I made, and been a little concerned and decided to, to check on me. This was probably two hours after I'd hurt myself, so it seemed um, uh, slightly odd to me that you know that that, that, that you know that this would kind of happen then. Um, and of course, it was also slightly odd to me, you know, that they didn't just come and knock on the door. Uh, so this was a, a furnished apartment that I was renting. I didn't know the upstairs neighbors. I bumped into them on the staircase, you know, and we kind of greeted each other but we didn't know each other by name or anything anyway so after i'd eaten um i actually ran upstairs to go and you know just to go and tell them that i was okay because i was mildly uh you know bothered that I, well they seemed concerned so i wanted to put their mind at rest because this was my rationalization of why this was happening 
And because uh, I ran upstairs, knocked on the door, and there was no reply, and that for me was the end of it. You know, that was enough. For, you know, satisfied me for the day. For, you know, of course, I went to bed and didn't actually, you know, didn't give it another thought. Um, uh, so, you know, on day one, I had satisfactory answers to the, you know, the the the, the who and why questions. Of course, on, then um, on day two, I heard the voices again. Uh, so now, of course, my explanation that the reason, uh, you know, that the, my neighbors might be peeking in my window and talking about what I'm doing no longer makes any sense. Uh, so, of course, you now start to ask the question, why again? So wh why is this happening? And, of course, you, you know, there, is no, there is no sensible answer to that uh, because, actually, there's no good reason why your neighbors would be peeking in the window on, on the second day. Uh, so of course this just keeps worrying at you, you know, at you for a while, and I just ignored it. Actually, I mean, uh, it wasn't uh, uh, you know, that intrusive um, on the on on the second day. It just seemed a little odd, uh, and it was still kind of you know, in the main room. So it, you know, I just ignored it. <clears throat> By day three, you know, when I was hearing voices again, uh, you know, I could still hear people talking about what I was doing. You know, this was now kind of very odd. Of course, now I'm starting to kind of say, well, the neighbors are very nosy. This is really unusual. It makes no sense. Um, um, and um, what really shifted the game was when probably, I don't know, remember the day exactly, but within the sort of first four or five days, uh, I could hear them talking about what I was doing in the bedroom and in the bathroom. And neither of these were visible from the fire escape. So that changed the game um, completely. My neighbors were now um, you know, complete, you know, were downright intrusive. Uh, which of course makes you feel very, very uncomfortable um, at home. I mean, I actually called a friend to come over and have a listen. I called the landlady. Not long after that, um, I, I gave notice. Um, so that's the that's the one thing. You know, it, 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 you know the, my response to it was to you know, was to do things, but it was actually to go you know, to call a friend and to call the landlady. Because by that stage, you're actually, uh, when, when this is happening in the bedroom, in the bathroom, this is now very weird. This is a very unusual behavior for the neighbors. And of course, if you confront them, they are simply going to deny it. So there's no point to me you know, in actually going and talking to the neighbors now you know, without some kind of evidence, you know, which of course is the path I set off on was actually, of course, was looking for evidence. Uh, and of course, I started you know, then to look at cameras. I started to look you know, at the cameras on my PC. I started to look for cameras in the apartment. I mean, you know, the only thing, I, the only conclusion I could reach was that because um, we, you know, the fire escape gave the upstairs neighbors, if you like, access to my windows, which I used to be open when I went out. I mean, there was a, um, a, a fly screen, you know, but that's all. But I mean, I, you know, I wasn't concerned about, about theft or anything because I said it was only the upstairs neighbors that had access. Uh, but now, of course, you start to say, well, you know, have they come in? Have they put cameras in? You're asking all these strange questions. And of course, there's this catch-22. You can't actually, you know, going and, going and confronting the neighbors doesn't make any sense because, you know, if it is them, they're simply going to deny it and you have no alternative explanation. I didn't have, as I say, a framework um, for, you know, for uh, you're describing it as auditory hallucinations um, uh, or as hearing voices. So, of course, it's, it was the neighbors. And of course, this was a very, very firm um, conclusion because it, there was no other logical explanation uh, and unfortunately it's a, it's an uncomfortable conclusion of course and that's what you know what is uh, escalating the emotional uh, response to it so those are the 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 two things that I want to focus on there were many many more things going on and I'll kind of talk about them in the second um, video on the first episode what I want to do here is just pick out um, these two things, so, so how, when and where I heard voices kept shifting the goalposts. And then what I want to do is just look behind that and show you the, the process you know, of how that actually escalated um, the problem I was trying to solve. But the, the, what the problem represents here is actually the emotions uh, because it was the, that's what was getting my attention. Uh, and so, of course, it was the problem I was trying to solve and because I couldn't solve it. Uh, of course, the emotions um, escalated basically, uh, and that's really how you know, how it took eight weeks to get to the point of a um, panic episode. So, as I've said so far, the um, the 
you know, I heard the sound of two voices, you know, talking about what I was, you know, talking about um, what I was doing. I was home alone. That was the context. That was the frame of reference I had for um, interpreting it. You know, what I heard was these two, what was these two um, comments. So these two comments are the stimulus that is presented to the mind. Remember, I'm going to show you that there's a process here. So, you know, so one of the, one of the elements of this process is the stimulus. And uh, this is just a dictionary definition of, of a stimulus. A stimulus is an event that evokes a specific reaction. You know, that's um, the, the emotional piece of it and rouses activity or energy. So that's what I do about it. Um, so, of course, what's happening here is my initial reaction, the emotion uh, here is you know, a quizzical one. I mean, I wonder, does it say why my neighbors um, would be looking in on what I'm doing? And as I've said, I've asked the questions, who and why? So the who, <clears throat> it's the neighbors, was pretty straightforward based on the context. The why, I rationalized, I said, okay, that seems reasonable. And this is an important step. Um, this is my emotions kind of being satisfied by the fact that I'd found a reasonable answer. Uh, so in my case, I, did, I ran upstairs, knocked on their door, um, and there was no reply. And I said, that actually was the, was the end of it for me. Uh, and the, you know, the end of it is signified by the fact that my emotions are now actually settled enough for me to say, okay, I found a reasonable answer. I'm feeling that as, my, uh, as an emotion. Okay. And uh, you know, that sort of ends that um, cycle. Of course, what restarted the cycle of what the bleep questions uh, was when the, the, the neighbours persisted in talking about what I was you know, doing. So this is the you know the, the the when thing. It's just that it's 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 continuing now the next day. Uh, so of course, what this is doing is producing a new reaction and a new cycle of what the bleep questions. And in this case, I actually don't have uh, a satisfactory um, answer as I did on day one. Uh, you know, so this emotion is unsettled, and because of that, it still it still um, holds your attention. Uh, of course, what happened next is, you know, that I mentioned the next key step, uh, you know, which might have been sort of four or five days later, was that I heard my neighbors speaking about what I was doing in the bedroom and in the bathroom. Uh, so now, of course, I say this introduces um, a new context. Uh, and the, the new context is actually the behavior of my neighbors. So this now is very, very suspicious behavior. And what this is doing is it's blocking off a course of action. This actually means now going and Speaking to my neighbors no longer seems reasonable. Uh, so what that means is that I now actually need to find um, evidence. So as I say, I called uh, a friend of mine, I called uh, my landlady, neither of whom uh, you know, could hear. Uh, my neighbors talking about what I was doing while they were there. Uh, so of course, what that does now is I need to find evidence. So I put the focus on how could this be happening? So that's the what the bleep cycle of questions that I'm asking. And this kept me busy for quite a while uh, as I explored all sorts of means via technology as to, as to how this could be happening. Uh, I even spoke to another friend about it who happened to have a little um, device you know, that actually can identify um, cameras in rooms just by, it's just a reflection off the lens and it's a silly little contraption that you shine around the room kind of looking for reflections. Uh, which he which he offered me and I, I used for you know for a day or so but I thought it was a complete waste of time. I mean I didn't think I was going to find a small camera anyway. Um, but nevertheless as I say what's happened here is the just by changing you know, the a change in the location where I heard voices or heard my neighbors speaking about what I was doing uh, introduced a whole new paradigm, a new context. My neighbors are now suspicious and you know, my, the actions available to me uh, changed. And of course, I set up on say, this cycle of, uh, of, of pretty wasteful um, effort. The next key shift for me, just focusing, I say, on these was the voices uh, continued, you know, for the following day and the following day. And you know, it would, by this stage, I was hearing them every day for odd little comments, at least part of the day. Uh, and it sort of, at some point, the sort of voices gradually started following me outside the apartment. And when I say gradually, uh, at first it was just outside the apartment door, you know, then it, and then it was on the staircase and then at the door to the building. 
uh, and then on the street and then up the block. Uh, you know, so that over a period of sort of probably the, you know, like that sort of five days or four days, uh, it grew from just outside the door to you know, the block. So of course, what this has done again is it's introduced another uh, context, a whole new context. I'm now you know, asking new what to be questions. I'm asking, well, who is it? Because I'm now questioning whether this is the neighbors. Not entirely sure that that makes sense anymore. Uh, and of course, I have no alternative answer because you know, this is just a question mark. This is just very weird. And of course, it's still uh, kept my focus on um, my technology. Uh, and of course, yeah, I'm now asking to say both how and, and why again. Yeah, but in the meantime, of course, my emotions have escalated to a pretty sort of angry um, and confused state. And this is because um, I haven't been able to find a reasonable, um, a reasonable answer. So you know, every day, my emotions are building and building and building. Um, and then what happened was because I you know, had at some point at this actually after I got the landlady in uh, and this continued to say in the, in the bedroom and bathroom, I decided that was not acceptable and I gave notice of my apartment. Uh, and at some point I had my PC uh, drive reformatted. Uh, because I've, I was obviously worried about you know, whether it was my PC that had been hacked. Uh, and this, I had the PC reformatted just uh, a couple of days before I was due to move out of the apartment, and I didn't want to take it back to the apartment in case it got infected again. Uh, so what I did was I booked into a hotel for the last weekend, basically, that I had the apartment. So I had this weekend that I was going to stay in the hotel, you know, whilst I still had this apartment, but it was before my next one was available. Uh, and I'd barely checked into the hotel uh, when I heard voices um, in the room, virtually as I walked into the room in the hotel. Of course, this is me trying to get away from voices, uh, from my neighbors or whatever this thing is, uh, talking about what I was doing. Uh, and, you know, and I thought I'd found a safe space um, in a hotel. And of course, that was not the case. I could still actually hear uh, these people talking about what I was doing. And that basically is what led to um, a panic I called a friend of mine who was uptown. I had, by this stage, I had taken my PC apart, I'd ripped the memory cards out. And I, you know, by the time I arrived at my friend's place, I had tossed the, um, you know, the memory cards into a flower bed and you know, had sort of knocked on his door with my PC um, you know, with, without memory cards. Anyway, he managed to calm me down. Um, and uh, it was you know, the, the following week I went to go and see. Um, uh, my doctor, and he described it as um, auditory hallucinations, which was quite a, you know, just, I didn't realize at the time how useful that was. Um, but, you know, rather than diagnosing me, I just had this technical term for this uh, strange phenomenon, uh, you know, auditory hallucinations. Uh, I could relate to the auditory um, piece, because uh, obviously I was hearing you know, the sounds of people you know, talking uh, to me. Uh, I couldn't relate to the idea of hallucinations because I couldn't see how my brain would actually be producing, you know, this kind of cycle um, of events. So even though I wasn't this clear on it at that stage, I still didn't uh, relate to the idea that it was hallucinations because for me, an hallucination would be uh, information in my mind, you know, it would be my processor somehow uh, collecting information from my mind and sort of processing it. So for me, I would get you know, flashes of memory or something along those lines. And of course, this, has, this is nothing like that at all. So for me, it was very clearly this kind of uh, you know, external thing that was very tactically uh, you know, undermining you know, what it is that I was um, trying to do. So um, let's just you know, simplify this page just a little and just kind of you know, I put names to these process steps because what you're seeing here is what's happening is the small change when and where is just making each of these cycles repeat uh, and it's just like making me ask a whole bunch of new what to believe questions you know at a, you know, in a different state of mind that you know of course the state of mind here is escalating uh, to the point of panic but this little cycle is just repeated uh, you know four times here basically so let's just you know uh, just point that out again um, uh, sorry, so of course, the other thing that I've got, you know, even though now I've described this as auditory hallucinations, uh, so that's my new context. What I still have, of course, is this, uh, is these voices actually 
uh, you know, talking to me and interfering and, you know, with, with my thinking. And of course, my own emotions are entirely unhappy about this. And of course, my own emotions are producing, you know, keeping my attention and producing a lot of my own thoughts about it. So this is still um, holding, holding my attention. So the process steps here are actually brain-based things. This is not the mind. This is actually the brain and how it's presenting new information. It's presenting new frames of reference. Uh, and we, we're not particularly aware of that. And this, this is, the, you know, this is the, the key point about this thing, is you know, I'm talking about how I'm hearing uh, voices in the bedroom, in the bathroom now, and that's what made me go and uh, you know, call a friend you have to come over and listen, and the landlady. Um, but actually looking at it from a process point of view is those small shifts have changed my frame of reference. They've shifted the context and they're, they're provoking a whole range of new questions. And of course those, and new emotions and you know, together those things are sending me off you know, to go and do a whole bunch of um, activities you know, that you will see from this thing were obviously all a waste of time because this wasn't, um, uh, wasn't the neighbors. I just didn't know that at the time. So, so first of all, what's happening here is that, you know, the stimulus was the two voices commenting on what I'm, what I'm doing. So I'm just putting process names to this, what was going on here. So this was the stimulus. My emotional reaction to it came from the fact that I didn't expect it. So there was an expectation, which was I was home alone. Uh, so the stimulus was presented out of context initially. And that's what, you know, you evoked the reaction, which is the, which is the emotion. So that's the reaction. Uh, and then, you know, the, it rises this activity or energy, you know, which is the response. So this is the thinking. Uh, and as I say, on the, in this first cycle, I also did run upstairs and knock on the, uh, on the neighbor's door just to let them know that I actually was okay. So that's also, you know, a part, that's, if you like, uh, an outcome in, 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 terms of what I, in terms of what I did. So the first outcome was that it's the neighbors. The second outcome, you know, was the behavior. I ran upstairs and knocked on their door. Uh, and of course, the, what was happening here from the process point of view is, was, you know, is that my emotions are what signed off, if you like. It's the, the emotion, you know, reaching the satisfactory emotion ended that um, particular cycle uh, in the mind in the sense that you know, I was able to let it go. I was, you know, it then didn't hold my attention. I went to bed and slept quite happily. Um, uh, of course, ever since then, because the voices have persisted, you know, it's been a battle to find uh, this point of happy emotion that signs off and, and, and it enables your mind to, to let go of it. And that's actually the problem is that this kind of cycle just continues. You know? So we have this ongoing prodding by voices. Uh, where it's not just what they're saying, but actually it's where they're saying it, it's the style, it's how they're saying it, it's what's going on around you. All of these other things keep introducing um, a new context. Uh, and of course, we are, each of those produces a reaction, the majority of them are happy. It provokes a new cycle of what the belief uh, questions. And of course, it holds our attention because the emotions associated with it uh, are, are actually unpleasant. And what happens is we get these you know, the two sources of, of inputs, if you like, the one is from the voices um, themselves, you know, where they're, they're offering specific information that is usually, I say here, this very clearly led me to the belief that this was the upstairs neighbors. The other is my own, you know, question and answer, what the bleep session in the mind, which, you know, because it's holding my attention, you know, I'm actually feeding in information of my own here. And I have, you know, there's this relationship with my own thoughts and there's this relationship um, with, uh, with voices. Uh, and of course, that's why, you know, this sometimes seems um, a little confusing, but nevertheless, uh, you know, some people you have some difficulty distinguishing between, between these, and I'm not too sure why, uh, but for me, it's actually very, very clear. This is something very different uh, than this. And I, you know, I've discussed this in the slides on phenomenology. Um, so again, just kind of summarizing, you know, what was going on here now in this kind of situation is I have an expectation of this thing. And, you know, it may be that I don't know what to expect of it, but this now has created its own frame of reference, which is creating new expectations. Uh, it's presenting stimuli that I say both from voices and from myself, uh, as I'm asking the what the bleep questions. Because the emotional uh, reaction to it is um, unpleasant, it's holding my attention. 
And what that's doing is, you know, this is provoking a whole lot more, um, you know, what the bleak uh, questions. So this is still all brain-based. You know, the, the expectation is kind of, uh, you know, we think of it the, particularly if it's something that's unexpected, you know, we've become more sort of hypervigilant, whatever, there's a brain component to, to what we're expecting. The brain is presenting this without us actually, you know, we don't walk into a room and kind of say, what am I expecting here, particularly, unless we're planning it. Uh, you know, we just walk into the room with an expectation that we're not even aware of. Okay, so this is the brain is actually making all of this happen, uh, although you can, of course, query it if, you, if, you, if you're aware of it. Uh, and so then there's these two sources of stimuli that are holding, the, the holding one's attention. Uh, and of course, all of these what the bleep questions are questions and answers that lead to um, interpretation. So this is the mind-based stuff, if you like, and this stuff is generally you know, brain-based. Um, and the, so what I want to show you as well through these other videos is that, you know, this, the interpretations, you know, which is where the mind takes over are actually more predictable uh, than we think. And you'll see this when I talk about um, the phenomenology um, in particular, and then the frames of reference in which we interpret the stuff, uh, that actually there's more predictability in here than we think. So this is the benefit of looking at it um, from a process point of view. So I'm simply saying, you know, the more, you know, the more thing about process is that actually we can model it. And of course, you know, processes work on a, on a very simple basis where you're looking at, you know, the input, what's happening in the processing um, and, in the, and in the output. Uh, and of course, with uh, the processes in the mind, uh, I'm representing this as flowing in both directions. And that's simply you know, because, I, because we can actually work from, we can and do work from either end of this process. We can decide what outcome we want and therefore kind of decide, well, you know, what sort of inputs would lead us to uh, you know, that output. You know, or we can assess stimuli as they um, arise and process them and kind of say, well, what range of outputs are available from this input? So the, the process in the mind, you know, sort of works both ways. And that's pretty, uh, you know, pretty well established theory. I'm simply combining um, three theories here. Uh, based theory of perception, which looks at the input side, you know, how the brain receives inputs from our environment. I'm using my uh, practice of neurolinguistic programming, you know, to talk about the, the, the output end, you know, how we go from what's in the mind to how we express that in terms of the outcomes that we're, um, that we're trying to achieve. And then the processing in the middle, um, as, I've, as you've seen uh, in the charts before this, is that actually what's holding my attention uh, is my emotions. So there's a relationship here between the information and our emotions. So to talk about that, I'm using um, Paul Gilbert's uh, emotional systems from his book called um, Mindful Compassion. And it's that combination of your know, information and um, emotion that is the experience um, of, of hearing voices. And of course, you know, this expression of it is the story that we're, that we're telling. So I'm going to represent this in two ways um, visually. Uh, one is to kind of map the, you know, is to sort of map the experience. Again, just kind of showing the process that we've already uh, spoken about. So two small pieces of information was enough to reach the conclusion that it's the neighbors. So this is, you know, a, a delusional belief, supposedly, uh, uh, and I say supposedly because actually the information would lead, you know, could only lead to that conclusion that this has sort of set the context. Um, you know, and of course, the, the point is that hearing uh, the neighbors was actually out of context, so it was unexpected. Uh, the stimuli here, what was changing the game was kind of where and when uh, they were presented. And this, of course, is what researchers are calling the phenomenology. The emotional response, this is when the new information is blending you know, with, with what I expect in my sort of patterns, produces a reaction. That's a body reaction. And I say you know, it's, in this case, you know, unpleasant because it's introducing um, a conflict and that's what's holding uh, attention. Uh, and of course, while attention is held, you know, I'm actually assessing the implications of it. So that's the response. You know, is my what the bleep questions are assessing the implications of it and of course, by doing that, I'm reaching interpretations. And I'm representing this with this sort of widening, um, 
you know, visual growth here is that, you know, a, a reaction that's kind of holding our attention, the longer it holds our attention, you know, the more implications we're assessing and the more interpretations that we're, that we're actually reaching. Uh, and then, of course, each of, each of these cycles was kind of ended by something, you know, whether it was, to say, the first one was pretty obvious, my emotions were satisfied. The other ones, I had to go to bed, <laughs> I had to go to sleep. So, of course, that stopped for a while. Of course, then the next day, it continued anyway. But what's happening is you're getting these kinds of episodes based on the context. And all that's happening is that this cycle is repeating. So, you know, we're going from an expectation or the lack of an expectation. You know, the voices are presenting uh, uh, these stimuli with lots of features and special effects that we call the phenomenology. It's producing an emotional reaction, which is a body thing. So this is all brain-based. Uh, you know, which then leads us to think about it and ask these what the bleep questions. Uh, and this is, you know, this is provoked by the brain, uh, but this is where we, we, you know, we can start to, uh, start to own it. We can start to intervene and actually do something about it. And then, of course, interpretations will have many, many, many interpretations on it. Uh, and as the contexts keep changing, uh, you know, we get all these different episodes. And of course, some of them are quite severe into their extreme states that lead to panic. So say when I heard the voices in the hotel, you know, that was um, panic. Uh, so these episodes, both in terms of thought and behavior, you know, add up to you know, a, a, an experience in the mind, which is this kind of lived experience. And of course, you know, some of them are spilling over into behavior and affect our outcomes in life. So this is the process map, uh, you know, mapping of an experience, if you like, to a process. So independent of what voices are actually saying, which, you know, what, they, what voices say introduces a context which sets an expectation and then the cycle um, continues and flows. And we get this uh, repeat of a series of what I call um, context episodes. Now, to simplify this a little uh, and simply say, here's another way to represent it. So when I'm talking um, theory, this is the model that I will actually use. And uh, what we have to remember is that perception is a predictive process. We don't evaluate a stimulus in isolation. It actually is something our processor is uh, considering. And of course, in doing that, it's kind of asking the question. Our processor is or the brain is asking the question, is prompting these who, what, why questions in a way that we, you know, we don't really notice until we put our, you know, focus our attention on, on that. Um, so I'm representing it here simply as um, the stimulus is evaluated you know, in a context. So this is the input side. Uh, the stimulus is evaluated in a context. It's producing a body reaction over here on the output side. This is where we have more agency. We can actually own, the, you know, own our response. Uh, so this is our, the what the bleep questions, and these are the outcomes that we achieve in the mind um, and in and in life. And um, we're what's holding our attention you know, is best gauged um, by our emotional systems. And these are the three, I paraphrased um, Paul Gilbert's language uh, to talk about the drive system, a soothe system, and our monitoring or threat system. So the threat system is monitoring our environment. The soothe system is checking on our outcomes, signing off on them if you like. Uh, and of course the drive system you know, is our response process it's, you know, it's the action that we are taking to achieve um, a, a desirable outcome. So these emotions, these three emotional systems are what is producing the sign off uh, at, at, to, you know, to close each you know, cycle of, of thinking, if you like. Uh, and of course, you can think of them as sort of traffic lights uh, at the different steps along this sort of process. And all that's happening is as we you know, process the information, we're getting a series of signals you know, along the process uh, that are our reward or our reward progression. So this is me simply kind of saying, I'll talk more about this later, but simply saying this is how we can actually represent, you know, what's, uh, what's going on and show the relationship between information and emotion you know, in our process of, uh, of perception, really, you might want to, you might want to um, call this. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's just how the mind is processing in, you know, information and I say it's, it's regulated by our um, emotional systems. So a key thing to take away from this is that 
what we need to be focusing on is the phenomenon that actually this is the thing that's changing all the time. It's presenting uh, new information in an intrusive way with uh, and yeah, I spoke just about where and when uh, I could hear voices. It has many other special effects to introduce, to keep introducing a new context. And of course, each new context uh, creates a whole new cycle. So for me, you know, this, my cycle, it, it, up to my first, to my first panic attack, uh, which is really what's usually thought of here as the sort of first episode, you know, had this sort of eight week uh, build up of emotions before it got to that sort of stage. And it started with something that was actually very, very logical. The information presented was, you know, led me to the conclusion that it had to be the upstairs neighbors. It was not delusional. I actually had information. I just didn't know that the information was coming from an unreliable source um, at the time. Uh, and of course that then, you know, escalated at some point to, to panic when I could still hear, you know, people talking about what I was doing in the hotel when I was trying to get away from them. And of course, then when I went to the doctor, I had this new frame of reference, uh, auditory hallucinations. And of course, what that had inherited was all the characteristics that I'd experienced, uh, you know, uh, through those eight weeks, you know, while I was actually um, in this apartment. And really what that was about was that, you know, this phenomenon is provoking the mind, so it's provoking a reaction and a response. Uh, and of course, because our, our process is predictive, we're trying to, you know, we're heading towards interpretations um, and outcomes. That's what, you know, that's what we're, our brain is trained to do. That's what it does all the time. Uh, and, and I'll show you later on, we can interrupt that process. Uh, and what it's doing is uh, it's, that's it, it's engaging the mind predictively. Uh, you know, the information that voices said led to a belief that it was the neighbors, which created a lot of doubt about the uh, motivation um, of the neighbors. So the implications of this belief are what escalated the emotion. And of course, then as voices kind of, you know, just shifted where and when I could hear them, the scale of the problem that I was trying to solve was escalated out of reach. So particularly once I started to hear the voices outside of the apartment, you know, the, you know, the opportunities I had to solve the problem, uh, you know, just were shifted out of reach. You know, when it was, when I was in the apartment, uh, I did go speak to the neighbors on day one, you know, when it seemed my behavior, my neighbors were behaving suspiciously, I reached the conclusion that confronting them was a waste of time because they would just deny it. So the, the you know, the, potential solution seemed to be blocked. When I started to hear voices you know, outside the apartment, you know, the scale of that problem was sort of way bigger than me. Uh, and of course, there is no opportunity to solve it. And the problem with that is we then don't reach this point of sign off on the emotions where the mind is happy to let it go. Uh, and of course, what happens then is this thing over here is capable of producing many, many, many more uh, varieties of special effects uh, that keep uh, changing the context and keep that process going and going and going. So we have all these episodes of thinking, some of which spill over into behavior. So in the next video, I will talk about the first episode again, and I will actually cover some of these other um, effects that you know, voices had up their sleeve to you know, make this problem uh, even worse than, you know, just to add layers of complication uh, to this problem, which is what makes it um, difficult for us uh, to see this. So thanks for listening uh, to this video. Uh, as you know, I'd like to keep as much of this as possible free for people to hear voices. If you can help me do that, please go to my fundraiser on crowdrise.com or someone you know hears voices. On social media, please use this hashtag. If you want to work together, you can reach me on greg at madjsense.com. Sign up on my website. And of course, as I say, other people you know, that sort of would welcome contributions are these players that I've mentioned before um, in other videos too. So thank you for listening. And I hope you enjoyed this.